All right. So I have posted the final critical thinking challenge on the Dropbox. I was going to give you a handout on that today. And the copy machine jammed, as usual. So I put instructions in the uh, Dropbox. What I want you to do is I want you to find an ad that your team thinks is great. Since we're moving into the fourth element in the, the marketing mix, the promotional element, find an ad that you, your team thinks is great. Give me the URL for that ad so we can watch some on Tuesday. And then in one well-developed paragraph, tell me why you think that ad is great. So that will be our final critical thinking challenge. And we'll talk about those on Tuesday. And then a week from today will be the fourth exam that will cover the module that will only include basically retailing and wholesaling and then three chapters on integrated marketing, communication, advertising, and promotion. So it will be, a, a, in terms of the chapter coverage, a shorter exam. And then, of course, there is the comprehensive final, which you all will have uh, all of the, basically most of the questions from the previous four exams. What I will do for the fourth exam, since you won't get it back, your Scantron back, before the final exam, I'll grade it as quickly as I can and get it posted to D2L, and then I will also post the answer key for the fourth exam so that you'll have that so that you can use it to study for the comprehensive final. Any questions on that? So we need to talk about advertising and promotion. And this is the part of marketing that everybody thinks of when you say marketing. And it's the fun part of marketing. So I wait till the very end so that you leave with a happy memory about marketing by talking about promotion. Because talking about logistics, the place part of marketing is the really boring part of marketing. And I think I've told you all before on numerous occasions that when I went to get my PhD, I went down to talk to OU and they said, well, we're a transportation logistics school, so you'd better be interested in that if you want to get a PhD here. And I thought, yeah. I can't imagine anything more boring than that, and so I didn't get my PhD there. It's probably the oldest field in marketing, but I didn't want to do that. This is the part that everybody, and nobody thinks of that as being marketing, but this is the part that everybody does think about as being marketing. When you think about, when you hear the term marketing, you think about what? Advertising. Why is that? It's the most obvious, most prominent to us. Yeah, it's the one that you're exposed to literally thousands of times a day. Every time you turn on the television, you're exposed to it. When you turn on the radio, you're exposed to it. When you walk down the street, you see billboard advertising. Some of you are walking billboards for ads. How many of you are wearing a branded article of clothing that displays prominently the brand name? I see King back there. What? Definitely not. Definitely not you. I see Oklahoma City University Athletics. Somebody is advertising another school. We should throw you out. For lack of, you know, lack of uh, dedication to loyalty. Nike, right? We're all exposed to this constantly. And it's really important. Unlike some of the, the four Ps, being the price part, there is a unifying theory here. And the unifying theory is that you need to speak with one voice. We call this integrated marketing communication. Now, if you went back in time from when I first started teaching marketing here at the University of Central Oklahoma, we actually offered courses called advertising. We no longer offer that course. Why is that? RT. What? Too artsy for us. Too artsy for us? <laughs> well, it's because what used to be the most prominent form of marketing, or the one that we think about the most, is actually one that is changing radically. We no longer just rely on advertisements. There are lots of businesses now that don't do any advertising in the traditional sense of advertising. My own business is one of them. We used to spend a huge amount of money advertising the Stone Lion Inn in various newspapers throughout the state of Oklahoma. We no longer do that. Our advertising budget has basically gone to zero, and we do everything through social media. And it's allowed us to really build our business and save us a huge amount of money. And so getting to the customer and reaching the customer uh, at the place that's going to be most receptive to that communication has become more critically important. And what's one of the things that we can all do with advertising now? 
How many of you actually watch ads other than the Super Bowl? You probably don't because you can do what? You, how many of you save your favorite shows so that you don't have to watch the ads, you go back and watch them, and you skip right through those ads? Turns out that advertising, watching the ads, actually increases your enjoyment of the programming because what happens is, as the program proceeds, one of the things that we know is that we want our stories to unfold in a linear fashion. The Russian linguist Mikhail Bakhtin says that we want this to be occurring in what he calls monoglossia, meaning that it has this beginning, middle, and end to it. That's not really the way life unfolds, is it? We don't really progress. Modern man considers themselves to be associated with a historic epoch, but in many respects, our lives are not necessarily linear. They may be cyclical. And Bakhtin says that we speak in what's called heteroglossia. If you listen to a conversation and you just transcribe it, it may not make any sense unless you're a part of the conversation. Think about conversations that you have every single day with your insignificant others. How many of you have children? I don't have children. I didn't want children, but now as a result of a divorce, I'm basically having to help my brother care for his two kids. And so I have these conversations that go something like, are you picking up the kids, or do I, for, for baseball today? Because his, his ex-wife is now out of town again, and he needs me to cover and pick up baseball. And the response is, Alyssa's not in town. Does that answer my question? Well, it does to me, because I understand, right? The answer to the question, if you're thinking in linear thought, would be what? No, I'm not picking up the kids. You need to pick up the kids, because Alyssa's not in town. And so we don't actually talk in this linear fashion but we demand that our stories do that, that they proceed in this monoglossia tone. There are novels that were developed as a result of this. If you, if you read a novel, what happens with the novel? Let's think about a murder mystery novel. How does, it, how does it happen? Well, it starts with you know some character background, and then what happens fairly early on in, in the murder mystery. Someone gets killed. And you proceed through the novel until you reach the end, and, it, and the killer is revealed at the ending, right? And it's this linear thing. Someone dies, there's this investigation in the middle, there's a climax, and then a what? Then an ending. Resolution. Does that actually happen in real life? A lot of times you don't get a resolution. It's one of the most frustrating things about being an adult. One of the things that I do love about being a college professor and I love about my job, as opposed to being an attorney. When I was the school's attorney, every time I would solve one problem, people would just find another way to screw something up, and I would have to fix that. But as a college professor, it's one of the things, and as adults, you don't usually get to do this. I actually get to plan my life in sort of a beginning, middle, and end. It's called a semester. You know when it's going to start, and you know absolutely there's this drop dead deadline at the end, but most of life is not like that. But we demand that we, at least in our advertising, our stories, speak in this sort of monoglossia. So there's this unifying theme that we have as a result of integrated marketing communication, which is we want to use the promotional mix, all of those elements of promotion, and speak with a unifying voice that provides the uh, consumer with an overview and an idea of what, what it is that we're getting. So the promotional mix are all the tools that we use to inform prospects about our products and its benefits, to persuade them to try it, and then to remind them about the benefits that they enjoy when uh, they were using the product. And a program that coordinates all of these activities is called integrated marketing communication. Now one of the things that you will see, particularly from practitioners in the field. So historically, what we had is we had people that were specialists just in television advertising, for example. And there's a great marketing show, for those of you who want to be marketers that you should watch, that kind of details the height of this era called Mad Men. It's now 
uh, ended and it's, in, it's in reruns and you can get it. How many of you have watched Batman? I just love it. They're smoking and drinking in the middle of the day. I miss those days when you could have, you know, highballs at noon and, and smoke around the clock. Even though I quit smoking 10 years ago, I still, I still jones for a cigarette every time I see it. So, uh, it details, you know, just the television advertising industry. And so there were specialists that did television advertising. You had specialists in print uh, media, in direct mail, in telemarketing, things like that. And you really thought of these as distinct silos. And these specialists in these silos would focus on their area of expertise. But if you don't coordinate those, what will happen is that you may become disjointed in the mind of the consumer. You may jumble the message, and they won't get a clear picture of what it is that you're trying to tell them. And so it's important to integrate all of these and speak with one unifying voice. And a lot of these practitioners would argue that maybe integrated marketing communication is just the latest buzzword. But if you don't integrate these, these ideas in the mind of the consumer, they'll do it for you. And they may not get the message that you want them to get. And so it's critically important that you get this right. So this is the communication process. This is the model, right? That you can, and your text has a slightly different version of this model. And in here it has, around this, what this red box is, is a mutual frame of reference for communicating. So it starts with encoding. As the product development person, I'm going to encode an, an advertising person for my company. I'm going to encode. I'm going to send a set of ideas and symbols that I want the receiver to decode. They're going to take this and transform it back into an idea. And the way they transform it is going to be influenced by their attitudes, values, and beliefs. They have to have a mutual shared field of experience. In my personal research, one of the things that I look at is political advertising. So I've studied political advertising for a long time. And the reason that I've done this is because I've run political campaigns for a long time. I ran my own campaign when I was vice mayor of the great city of Guthrie, Oklahoma. I ran my mother's campaign when she was vice mayor before me. I ran lots of city council campaigns. I ran Lori Williams, or I worked at Lori Williams' campaign when she ran for Congress. The first big political campaign I worked out on was when I was in high school. I worked uh, for as, a, as an assistant to the assistant campaign manager for David Walters. And so I've been involved in this in a long time. And so one of the things that I'm interested in is political messaging. Now it turns out that in political messaging, one of the things that we all talk about as Americans are the idea of family values. I think I've talked about this in here before. Family values. What comes to mind? when you say family values. So both Republicans and Democrats use this term, family values, but they have radically different fields of experience. And so when they talk to each other, they tend to talk past each other because they don't have the same frame of reference. They don't have the same field of experience. For Republican, what does it mean to say family values? What is it that they mean? Jesus. It means what? Jesus. <laughs> well, not necessarily, but it is a strict father model. That's what the, the nuclear family is what they mean. They mean the traditional American family. What is that? It's what? Dad works eight hours, mom stays home. Yeah, dad goes off to work and mom stays at home. Or even if she does work, it's a mom and a dad and 2.875 children or whatever the average is, whatever the normal is. And when we talk about normal again, this is when we use this term, what we're referring to is this idea of a distribution. And so what are the vast majority of people, if you went back, for example, to the 1950s and 60s, that distribution, what would the normal distribution look like for an American family? Well, it was the mom and dad, and it was this statistically average 2.875 children, or whatever you know, it was for, for that time period. So basically, three kids. Mom, dad, three kids. That's what they think about when they say family values. 
going to church on Sunday. When I was growing up in Oklahoma, if you didn't go to church on Sunday, people looked at you funny if you grew up in a small town like I did, Guthrie, Oklahoma. And you didn't go to church, you, you know, you were a heathen. When Democrats say family values, they say we have family values. What do they mean by family values? What does a Democrat mean by family values? That gives them a different field of experience. It could be their significant other, their insignificant other. It could be mothers and two mothers, two dads. It could be an extended family. Hillary Clinton wrote a book based on an African proverb called It Takes a Village. That's not what Republicans mean. When Republicans mean family values, they mean the strong father model because that interferes. This idea of it takes a village interferes with that authority figure that's central to the family. What is it? But for Democrats, they say we have family values, and they mean everybody that it takes to raise a child. And for Democrats, they, they expand this net out to include all of these other people that are important in that child's life. Their teachers, their cousins, their friends. And a family is not necessarily defined by blood or affinity. That's a legal term for marriage. It's not, de it's not determined by the blood or the marriage certificate. It's determined by those people that impact you. So they have radically different fields of experience. And then you have noise. So I want you to go, I'm going to go back and I want to read something to you. And I want you to tell me what part. The first one to come up with an answer to this will get bonus points for today. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to read you something from the autobiography, or the biography, not the autobiography, of Warren Buffett by Alice Schroeder called Snowball. How many of you know who Warren Buffett is? You should. As business students, this should come tripping off your tongue. He's oftentimes referred to as, what's his nickname? Oracle of Omaha. The Oracle of Omaha. That's correct. He's called the Oracle of Omaha. He is the head of Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway is trading today a Class A share and over $200,000 for one share of Class A Berkshire stock. He's a brilliant investor. At one point in time, he was the richest man in the world. He's lost that position to uh, one of his good friends, Bill Gates, although it's now hypothesized that actually the richest man in the world is who? Jeff Bezos? No. Vladimir Putin. They estimate that Vladimir Putin is maybe the richest man. He may be worth $600 billion, according to the, the most out there estimates. But nobody knows because Unlike American investors who have to sort of release this stuff uh, through SEC reports, their stock, you know, one of the things that makes it hard to, to evaluate Donald Trump's uh, wealth is that what? He won't release his tax returns. He won't release his tax returns and he doesn't, he's not an SEC reporting company because the Trump organization is what? Right. It's a privately held, closely held company, it's not publicly reported. But for people like Warren Buffett, it's easy to figure out because that's listed and these things called the 10Ks and 10Qs that Berkshire Hathaway has to file. Berkshire, at one point in time, they, they convinced Warren and his alter ego, a guy that you probably have never heard of, but has been equally as important as the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, he's an attorney named Charlie Munger, to take over a company called Solomon Brothers when Solomon Brothers is going broke. And it becomes apparent that there's a lot of problems at Solomon and the CEO is maybe not actively involved, but was complicit in some of the trading and, and irregularities that were occurring. But he has what's called a golden or platinum parachute as part of his compensation package. What does that mean? What are golden parachutes used for? If the company fails, he still gets a lot of money. Not necessarily if the company fails. If they fire you, you get a lot of it. If you're asked, so. If your company is taken over in a hostile takeover and they fire everybody, you're well taken care of. You're provided with you know, enough to, to go out there and be okay. And so it becomes a dispute as to whether or not he's entitled to any of this money uh, in, his, in his severance package. And there's these conversations that take place between Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, 
And the guy whose name is John Gutfrey, who was the head of Solomon, uh, his attorney on an evening that he was trying to negotiate for them. There's probably nothing worse than being read to, but I'm going to read this passage to you. I often think that the, the perfect punishment for a recalcitrant student would be for me to read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason very slowly to you, but I think this passage illustrates one of the problems in the communication process. And whoever can get it right will get 10 bonus points for today, the first one to raise your hand. So, Gutfried sues, and it's in his contract they have an arbitration provision, which means that you go to basically a private court. How many of you watch the uh, court proceedings on television, like the People's Court, that was the first one, Judge Judy, any of those, anybody watch any of that kind of stuff? I, I hate them as an attorney, they're absolutely horrific. That's actually not a real court, right? Judge Walker was a retired judge, he was the first one to do this, but he was no longer really a judge. That's what we call binding arbitration, where you agree to submit your dispute rather than going through the court system, the formal court system that's provided by the government, to a neutral third party. It's called what we call alternative dispute resolution. And in certain instances, it's required. In other instances, you can submit voluntarily to an arbitrator, and it may or may not be binding in that case depending on what you, what you choose to do. But in this case, it was a binding arbitration that he was, that he was um, uh, agreed to. So it takes them to the arbitrators to get some money. And they had agreed that he was owed something, but what was agreed upon is what's in question. Over and over, the arbitrators heard about a meeting between Charlie Munger and Philip Howard, John Gutfried's lawyer, in which Howard reviewed the list of compensation Gutfried wanted, and Munger listened in some fashion or another. All agreed that Howard had left without a, sec a signature on Gutfried's severance papers, but there was no agreement about how to interpret the rest of the events of that evening. Howard was certain that Munger had made a deal with him. Gutfried's lawyers called Charlie Munger as a witness. Frank Barron of Cravens, Swain, and Moore had attempted to prepare Charlie Munger who was utterly impatient with the process. Although Barron had prepared Munger by himself, Munger, a lawyer who disliked paying legal bills, extemporized to the arbitrators that in preparing him for his testimony, Craven had employed an excessive number of expensive paralegals and aspirin carriers. When he began to testify, every word that came out of his mouth had nothing to do with what we had gone over in the preparation, said Barron. Putting Charlie Munger on the witness stand was the most nerve-wracking, hair-raising experience I have ever had as a lawyer. Munger's confidence, on the other hand, as a witness was unmatched. A number of times, the lead arbitrator, growing <coughs> irritated, admonished him, Mr. Munger, would you please listen to the questions before you begin to answer them? Munger insisted that on the night that he had met with Philip Howard, he was deliberately not listening. Being polite, but I wasn't paying much attention. I sort of turned my mind off. I was just sitting there politely with my head turned off. Gutfried's lawyers asked him whether he'd made a conscious decision not to talk as well as to not listen. No, said Munger, when the time came to talk, I talked. One of my faults, I'm fairly outspoken. I may well have discussed some individual things that got through my band of indifference. This is one of my most irritating conversational habits and it's followed me throughout the course of my lifetime. So every time something would get through my band of indifference and I could see a counter-argument, I would give it. Howard had asked for indemnification for Gutfried against lawsuits. This being a legal matter had gotten through Munger's band of indifference. I think I said to him, you don't even know what you're going to need. God only knows what you're going to need. There will be litigation. This will be a big damn mess. Who knows how things are going to work out? You're misrepresenting your own client if you think it makes any sense to get into any of these issues at this time. Was this a conversation in which you were tuning out, asked Edward's lawyers? No, I tend to tune in when I'm speaking myself, said Munger under oath. I tend to remember what I say. Was this a conversation in which you were deliberately not listening at various times? What did you say, said Munger? I just tuned out again. I wasn't doing it on purpose. Was this a conversation in which at various times you were deliberately not listening? I'm ashamed to say, I've done it again. Will you please do it for me one more time? I'll use some effort this time. Gutfried repeated the question for the third time. You bet, said Munger. I was just going through the motions. 
In what mental state the arbitrators, the lawyers, and Guthrie heard these words can only be imagined. Regrettably, much of the misunderstanding seems to have lain in Philip Howard's unfamiliarity with the outward signs of the inward workings of Charlie Munger's mind. He had labored the entire evening under the illusion that he and Munger were having a conversation. He didn't recognize that Munger's occasional replies as intermittent thought bursts, ignited by some random light that had pierced his band of indifference, was merely him being lectured. Whenever Munger objected, Howard assumed they were negotiating, not that he was simply being lectured to. When Munger said nothing or admitted a grunt to move the conversation along, Howard inferred that Munger had agreed, or at least that he had no objection to what had just been said. Nobody had explained to him that Munger's head was turned off. Guthrie's lawyers reminded Munger of Buffett's testimony, in which he acknowledged, saying to Guthrie that he had the power to make all of this happen. Did Mr. Munger recall Mr. Buffett saying that? I don't remember Mr. Buffett's words as well as I remember my own, said Munger, but certainly the gist of the thing is that you can count on us to be fair. The issue was what was meant by fair. Solomon never disputed that the money was Guthrie's, that he had earned it. The argument boiled down to whether Guthrie would have been terminated had all the facts been known. Thus, the case became an exercise in proving that Guthrie should have been terminated. Even Donald Freudstein agreed that in considering what he knew from Glovner, Guthrie had been dishonest with the, go with the government. Everyone thought this was sort of a bizarre, out-of-character behavior. Nonetheless, it had happened. In fairness to Solomon, Guthrie understood why the firm was expending so much effort to prove that he shouldn't be fired. He knew it was in everybody's interest to vilify him. But the lack of proportionality bothered him. At some point, it should have ended, he thought. Nonetheless, everyone Buffett included <coughs> felt that Guthrie was entitled to some money. Buffett had Sam Butler, a fellow Geico board member, in front of Guthrie's column twice and offered him $14 million. But Butler whispered, I can probably get you a little bit more. Buffett would have gone to 18. But Guthrie had been humiliated by the process. He considered Charlie Munger mean-spirited and self-righteous. He turned the offer down in dignity indignantly, the arbitrators would decide. After months of testimony lasting until the spring of 1994, the arbitrators were showing their impatience at the endless, circulous, and conflicting arguments, one side professing complete innocence, and the other portraying Guthrie as an arch fiend. Then, at the closing statements, Guthrie's lawyers showed up with a chart, raising the demand to $56.3 million by adding interest penalties, stock appreciation, and other items. The lawyers and people involved in Solomon had and set up a betting pool as the arbitration crawled at an agonizingly slow pace towards its conclusion. How much money would the arbitrators give that free? The lowest bet was $12 million, the highest was $22 million. No one will ever know what factors the arbitrators weighed in their decision. When the decision was announced, they awarded Guthrie nothing, not one dime. So what part of the communication process is broken down in this example, yes, Mr. Um, there's three points that I fell apart was with the coding for uh, whenever they were talking to the witness on the stand. Uh, I'm sorry, I blanked out, forgot the name there. Um, but he, uh, this witness was saying that he was, wasn't like he was hearing the information, but he wasn't receiving it. So the, the, he was he wasn't decoding that properly. Uh, another breakdown was he, there's just all the noise that's going on. He wasn't in the room mentally. And then finally, it could, all, it could be just a matter of feedback issue because the sender wasn't realizing the guy wasn't paying attention. Yeah, um, that's correct. It's noise. And the reason that you've got this feedback problem is because of the what? Noise. It's because of the noise. That's correct. It's the noise that's interfering with this. And it's amazing how often this happens, how much we think we know what happens in an event. But there's a classic experiment that was done in sociology that, that, that depicts this. They had a professor in sociology, the first time it was done was in like the 1960s. Come in, they had this guy come into a classroom, run into a classroom, basically assault the professor and run out. And then they interview the students after that experience. And that guy is tall, short, thin, fat, white, black, Hispanic, wearing a ball cap, bald, had a, you know what I mean? There's everything in between. It's this noise that interferes in this experience that we have, that we really have to, to, to worry about and think about. Um, be sure and make sure I get your, your uh, bonus points for that. <clears throat> so the promotional elements that we can use. There's advertising. Now each of these has advantages and disadvantages, and coming up with the right mix 
is what's going to be critically important in this integrated marketing communication. Achieving the balance that will reach the consumers that you have, that you want to select or that you have selected as a result of that segmentation, targeting, and then positioning process, reaching them in the most effective me me medium that, that will get you the highest rate of return is going to be critically important. And all of these have advantages and disadvantages. There's advertising, personal selling, public relations, sales promotion, and then direct marketing. Those are the five things that we can use as this part of the for this key. So advertising. Advertising is any paid non-personal communication. Now there's two important things to, to notice about this. In a lot of the media, we can get different types of space that may or may not be paid. So the first element to notice is that it's paid. When we talk about promotion, we can also talk about public relations, and that's not paid necessarily. So any paid non-personal. The second thing is the non-personal aspect. So pay, we have to pay for the space by the organization, the person who's doing the advertising. They can use any mass media, TV, radio, magazine, and now the internet. Historically, this has been expensive, but it's becoming less so. Why? Social media and the internet are allowing it to be much cheaper. You can monetize, and one of the things that we've done on our Facebook is we monetize certain promotional elements that we have for our business, and rather than spending $1,000 on an ad, we're spending 20 or 30 bucks to get Facebook to basically blast it out there for us. But it's not personally tailored to the, to the specific. It's historically been expensive. What is the cost? We talked about this. One of you did a, uh, a paper for your group presentation on Super Bowl advertising. What's the cost for a 30 second ad at this last year's Super Bowl? What was it? Who did the presentation on Five million. Five million dollars. That's a lot of money. Particularly for small businesses. How many businesses can afford? Last year at the Super Bowl, they did something unique, which was there was a company that basically gave away an ad to somebody else who couldn't afford it. That allowed them to advertise at the Super Bowl, but a lot of places can't afford it. So that's a downfall. It can be expensive. What's an advantage to it? You can reach a lot of people. If you put an ad on television, you can get a lot of coverage particularly at events where people are not likely to DVR it. So this is still a significant source of promotion, but what kinds of events are now becoming more critical in terms of advertising that people can't DVR past? It's going to have to be events that time is sort of of the essence to watch it. What are those kinds of events? Well, the Super Bowl is a big one because what? Everyone's watching. Uh, yeah, and they, they deliberately watch for the ads. If, if you don't like football, people will watch the Super Bowl. But if you do like football, why are you not going to DVR that? You learn how to win. Right? Yeah, once, once you know, the thrill of the play becomes a lot less you know, important. And so live sporting events and things like that are one place where advertising still gets a lot of people because they're not going to DVR past it. But what may they do other than at the Super Bowl? What? Advertise inside the stadium. Okay, you can advertise inside the stadium, but what can people do even if they don't DVR? So I really like a lot of sports. I particularly like basketball, and I'll watch Thunder basketball on television. But what happens when the ad comes on? You get up and go get food, you go to the bathroom, you do other things. So you don't know that they are getting that message. So you don't know whether or not they're receiving the message. You get a lot of coverage but you may not necessarily get people to actually watch it. The problem is that it doesn't allow for immediate feedback. So you can put an ad out there and then you can see, sort of monitor and see whether or not sales increase, but actually calculating the ROI can be difficult. Personal selling. This is the direct two-way flow of communication between a buyer and seller. It allows you to have absolute control of who the presentation is made. 
You're not wasting your coverage. If I put an ad in the Gazette, if I take out a radio spot on uh, KXY or whatever for my business, I don't know who's listening. I can't tailor that message. What can I do with personal selling? I can tailor that message directly to the consumer that I am trying to get. So it reduces the waste of coverage. It also allows for what? One of the things that I do as a service provider in this class is that I start to notice when people do what in here that allows me to get feedback on the service that I'm providing. People start checking their phones. Yeah, when people start looking at their devices, when they start checking their phones, if I see starts to go to sleep, I can change my presentation. I can use different inflection. I walk around. One of my colleagues used to throw erasers at people's heads. Uh, you know, if they fell asleep. You know, I can do different things to get you back involved. So I get immediate feedback, but it can lead to this instant feedback can lead to what? Well, inconsistency in communicating. If you are not really good and you don't trust your sales force and you don't train them really, really well, they may start telling things that you don't want them telling customers or writing checks or making promises that you can't deliver on. And one of the worst things, salespeople are highly motivated, unlike a lot of other professions, they are highly motivated by money. For most people, when we do job satisfaction surveys, where do they list compensation, would you guess, and in terms of importance? You think it's number one? How many do you think it's number one? You think it's number one? Why do you think it's number one? It's the bottom line. It's the bottom line, that's why you work? Why do you think it's number one? Because if they're motivated by money, that would be more obviously compensation. Okay, for, are you talking about salespeople or people in general? My question was about, so this is maybe an example of noise getting in, or maybe I didn't make myself clear enough. I'm asking about in general, not just salespeople, but across the spectrum of jobs, where do you think money ranks with regard to most people in their demands and their job satisfaction? Third. You think third? <sighs> Getting closer. Second. Lower than third. Sixth or seventh. Yeah, it's in the top ten, um, depending on which survey. But it's it's not a, it's not a one, two, or three. Why do you think that is? Why is it that you're here on a Thursday afternoon listening to me yammer at you? Experience. The experience? Poor way of wording it, but we, we can't have uh, get, gain this knowledge by being at Walmart right now or just sleeping in. Okay. So at least we're getting this quality of interaction and understanding of marketing. I think I've told you all before, if I haven't, um, it's, it's good for you to hear this. But if I have, redundancy is a good thing because it, it reinforces my message. Thomas Jefferson founded the first secular, publicly funded institution of higher education in the world. It was called the University of Virginia. And when he founded that institution, historically, institutions of higher education were promoted and, and funded by a religion. The three oldest professions for which there was an academic discipline are theology, law, and then medicine. Those are the three original learned professions. And they start with theology because the church needed a way to transmit knowledge to the clergy, to go out and preach the gospel. Then, becomes, then the law is the second oldest, and then medicine. So there in Europe, old institutions of higher education are usually associated with a church. Thomas Jefferson founds this institution in Virginia. It's totally secular, so it's removed from religion, and it's publicly funded. And he didn't want it to be an institution that granted degrees. He wanted to bring the finest scholars from around the world to lecture at the University of Virginia. And he wanted you to come listen to the lectures and leave when you felt educated. 
and not get a degree. How many of you would do that? Mr. Nail is the only one who's willing. Most of you want that piece of paper at the end of this experience that says what? I'm educated and therefore I am qualified to get a better job. Now, when I was vice mayor of the great city of Guthrie, Oklahoma, we had to bid for our waste removal. So I know what garbage men make. It's not a bad job anymore. It used to be that nobody would want to be a garbage man. I still don't know anybody that says, I yearn to be a garbage man. I want to do it. After I read some of your essays, sometimes I want to be a garbage man because it, you know, I wouldn't have to listen to the dribble anymore. <laughs> it's not a bad job. They ride around in a vehicle that picks up. You know, There's this arm that comes out. In the olden days when I was a kid growing up, they had to go out. There were two guys that rode on the back of the garbage truck, and there was a guy that drove it. So the, the prime position was to be the driver in this process. And the two guys on the back actually had to pick up these trash cans and throw them into the back and then, uh, and then set them back down. And there was a movie that was made by Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez about garbage men. It's not a bad job anymore, right? This arm comes out, it picks it up, it dumps it in the bag, and, and they make about $35,000 a year. Not a bad job, right? When I had a student who wrote on an essay for an exam, did I tell you this story? I approached this problem eager as a squirrel in an oak forest when the answer came to me wham bam like an elephant in a circus tumbling routine. And I wrote on that essay, I leapt like a gazelle to the conclusion that you deserve an F for making me read this dribble and you need to take a creative writing course to get this out of your system. <laughs> I, I, I think maybe being a garbage man would not be that bad of a thing and, and when I have to read things like that. But the reason that most of you are here is because you want a job that provides you with meaning. You want to do something that you enjoy. If you're going to have to do this for the best part of your life, you don't want something that just provides you with earning a living. Most of you and what most people tell us in these in these job satisfaction surveys is that providing a meaningful work, having meaningful work, is far more important to them than money. Until you get to salespeople, and then salespeople will tell you they're highly driven by what? Money. Money. Because it's the one profession where you can determine your own salary. My friend Adam, who works for US Food, says, if I want to take my kids to Disney World this year, all I have to do is I just have to earn an extra $100 a week in commission. I just have to sell an extra case of meat. It's the one profession where you can really set your own salary. If you want to, you can work for it. But most people want something other than that. And so with salespeople, the reason I point all of this out is that it can lead, if your motivation is to sell and your commission is based on selling, you may give inconsistent messages because as you're receiving the feedback from those people, what you're focused on is what? Maybe getting the commission. Now, what we try to train you to do in our sales program is recognize that there are some clients that you don't want. And making a quick sale today may not be the best way over the long haul for you to get consistent results. But this is expensive. It takes a lot of money to train a salesperson well. It's one of the reasons that our graduates are so highly sought is because we provide really good training in this. And so companies are aware that they don't necessarily have to invest as much in training if they, if they hire people from our program. But it can lead to inconsistency in this communication and thus destroy your attempt at integrated marketing communications unless you're really good at it. Now, it can also be extremely high in cost. Why? Most of the sales positions that we have, that we uh, recruit for, or that we allow to come in to recruit, are base plus commission. The standard base here is about $50,000 plus commission for a lot of the jobs that we have and for those that come to our sales forum. That's an expensive base, right? So if they're meeting with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, that's costing you a lot of money in terms of their time if they're not making sales. So it can be 
extremely high, and you're not reaching that mass coverage that you could get with advertising. Public relations. Lots of places that you can use this, and it's uh, in many instances free. So you can have special events, lobbying efforts, annual reports and press conferences. So one of the things that every company does, and my company did, when we would release our, our uh, 10Qs and our 10Ks, we would also put out a press release with that and we'd send it to places like the Daily Oklahoma, the Journal Record, and stuff like that. And you are going to get free press. Lots of, there's people like the Journal Record particularly are looking for content to put in their paper. Now what's the disadvantage of this? Well, it's not directly paid, so what happens to your control of the message? You can lose control of the message, and they may give a message, they may pick up on something in your press release that you don't want to focus on. And you, if you lose that control of the message. So it's important, it's, it's valuable in that you can get it for free, basically, you can pump out press releases all day long when you release products and Apple will get when they release a new product when they release the um, Apple Watch which I think is a branding failure by the way why didn't they stick with everything else what are all their other products called iPhone, iPhone iPad you know, iBook why did they decide to go back to Apple for the watch how did it go back to where they started in a sense how maybe rebranding yeah, I don't know. But it syncs with your what? Your iPhone. So why didn't they call it the iWatch? I don't know. But when they released that product, they got a lot of press on it. There was a lot of buzz on this product. Not all of it was good. They got a lot of publicity off of that release, but you know, journalists in the business community picked it up. What were some of the early criticisms of the watch? Battery life was poor. You know, you have to charge it. There were there were problems with it, and so not all of it can be is necessarily good. Sales promotion. These are usually short-term inducements. Um, you can use coupons, rebates, samples, contests, and sweepstakes. Now, what's a good part of this? Unlike advertising, and unlike public relations, where you don't get feedback. You know when you put out a coupon how many people use the coupon. You can track it very easily. If you put out uh, coupons on what are some of the big online promotions now? Groupon, for example. You know exactly how many you sold and you're going to know how many are what? How many are redeemed. That's great. Provides you with a lot of information. What's the disadvantage of that? What has happened? So JCPenney and Macy's both do this thing where they send out, JCPenney particularly sent out lots of coupons and they always had a sale. And they basically trained their customers to wait for the sale and wait for the coupon. And when JCPenney decided that they didn't want to do that anymore, what happened? Their sales dropped off, their customers abandoned them because they were used to what? They had been trained to, so JCPenney wanted to do basically what Walmart was. They, they changed their model from doing the sale because Macy's does this all the time. Is there, is there ever, like technically from a legal standpoint, things cannot be on sale 365 days out of the year. If you do that, you are misleading the consumer and it is no longer a sale. So what will happen is that items will go off of their white sale or their President's Day sale for like 30 seconds or a day or whatever it is that's the, the minimum. And then they instantly go back to what? The sale price. And then people also get these coupons. You can track it, but you train your consumer to wait for those coupons. And what happens when you try and change the promotional strategy? Well, it becomes confusing in mind. So JCPenney basically wanted to go to a Walmart-like strategy. We're just going to set the prices low. And it'll be like everyday low prices. Two problems with that. One was you trained everybody to respond to these promotions. 
And the second was that when you think about stuff like you're willing to accept everyday low prices for things like green beans, how many of you are brand loyal? Like, I, I, I love green beans. That seems to be a staple in my family in terms of our diet. Got to have those, you know, good carbs, not bad carbs. And green beans are easy to do. And if you put enough butter on them, they're really good. Or I may be defeating the purpose. How many of you are brand loyal to a, to a particularly, you know, like green giant? Or do you just look at the grain? Do you just grab the most convenient can of green beans on the shelf? Anybody loyal to the can of green beans? You are? Why? You think there's a difference between the great value brand of green bean and the green giant brand of green bean or Libby's? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Bring some cans in here. You can taste the difference between great value and Libby's. Green beans. In my experience, it just depends on when you open the packet, if it's mushy, I mean, yeah. and if it tends to be mushy um, more than a couple of times, then I won't buy that brand again. Okay. I've, I've seen more stims in a generic, but other than that. You see, it, that is, you probably do find more, maybe more stem. Oh, they come from the same plant many times. Now, there are differences, I will tell you, in tomatoes. Because the way they peel, for example, the stewed tomatoes or diced tomatoes, uh, some companies use lye, and if you use a higher quality brand, they don't. They, they use steam to peel them, and there is a difference there. But for green beans, I'm not thinking there's a great big ball of difference there. Is that true with clothes? So you're willing to accept every day, and nobody's going to judge you based on your can of green beans, are they? When I serve my friends green beans, when they come over to my house for a dinner party, do they know if I bought the Lubies or the, you know, and when I was a kid growing up, Lubies had this commercial that tried to get you to be brand loyal to green beans and, or whatever it was they were selling in the, in the can. It was, if it says Lubies, Lubies, Lubies on the label, 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 you will like it, like it, like it on your table, 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 because it's Lubies, Lubies, Lubies on the label, label, label. Lubies, Lubies, it's Lubies. Uh, Lubies was the, the uh, cafeteria. Lubies. So, I, does anybody know if I use the great value brand of green bean? Clothing's a different deal, isn't it? People are very brand conscious when it comes to things like articles of clothing. And the J.C. Penny buyer didn't want to be seen as necessarily, I think, having that everyday low value in their in their items of clothing. And so it was a big problem. So sales promotion it can work. It's short term. You can track it. It's easy, but it's generally for limited durations. People who are really couponers, anybody know any extreme couponers? I have several friends that are extreme couponers and they tell me about this. And as a marketer, I'm interested and I just think that how pathetically boring their lives are. They spend all this time looking for these coupons and they're not at all brand loyal. People who use coupons like this and are extreme couponers have no brand loyalty. They're always looking for the what? The next, yeah, the best sale or the best coupon. So those are some of the disadvantages. I'm about out of time, and I'll give you the rest of the time to come up with your, to talk to your groups about your ads, so that we can look at those on Tuesday. We can look at some ads. It's the fun part. We'll talk about uh, why you think those ads are great. And I guess I forgot to have the roll. Um, so I did. Yeah, I forgot to have the roll. Sorry about that. Is it just a good place? I think it's a good place.